Hi, in this video let's have a discussion pertaining to the rest of the multiple choice questions from cumulative 2. So it includes physiology, biochemistry, micropath as well as pharmacology, right? You can get all these questions from our Google group. So coming to the first one, bisphosphonates are useful in treating osteoporosis, Paget's disease, osteolytic bone metastasis, option A and B. So which one is the most appropriate answer? In fact, bisphosphonates are used mainly to inhibit resorption. They have this vital role in inhibiting resorption by blocking osteoclasts and their related functions. So bisphosphonates include ethydronate, palmitronate and alendronate, right? So these inhibit bone resorption, very, very important. And these have strong affinity for calcium phosphate. Make a note of it and also the net mechanism of action of these bisphosphonates is accelerated apoptosis of osteoclasts very very important and also they disrupt the cytoskeleton and ruffle border of osteoclasts so by inhibiting osteoclasts they are inhibiting resorption hence they have numerous clinical applications they can be used for preventing osteoporosis postmenopausal osteoporosis most commonly seen in women they are also known to inhibit the spread of osteolytic lesions which are seen in Paget's disease which is because of abnormal osteoclastic function as you all rightly know and also they are used in cases of osteolytic bone metastasis also which reduces osteolytic lesions as well as bone pain so bisphosphonates reduce the osteolytic lesions and also the bone pain associated bone pain and bisphosphonates can also be used in hypercalcemia of malignancy wherein they will normalize the pl plasma calcium levels so we have numerous applications of bisphosphonates they can be used in treating osteoporosis Paget's disease osteolytic bone metastasis and hypercalcemia of malignancy now coming to the question so bisphosphonates are useful in treating osteoporosis Paget's disease and also osteolytic bone metastasis right so we don't have a right answer here so option a b and c are right they can be treated with bisphosphonates okay now let's move on to the second question we have an image based question or uh, image of a baby where you can see gross swelling of lips face cheeks etc right so what does this condition represent marasmus quashiorker hypothyroidism dwarf dwarfism so which one is the more appropriate answer anyways let's have a brief discussion of what is quashiorker and what is marasmus so both we have deficiency of energy, deficiency of proteins, deficiency of calories. Now let's see what each one means literally. So marasmus is a syndrome which is usually of chronic nature. It's a chronic illness, marasmus. And the time duration is, it takes months. I mean, the clinical setting, the time duration is months. And coming to clinical features, there is history of weight loss, muscle wasting, and most importantly, loss of subcutaneous fat. Very, very important to underline these points right and laboratory findings there can be normal or mildly reduced serum proteins and prognosis is variable depending upon the underlying disease or underlying cause so to summarize marasmus is a chronic illness of greater duration months together and there is history of weight loss muscle wasting and there is no subcutaneous fat and also laboratory findings normal or slightly reduced serum proteins and the prognosis is variable now coming to Quashiorker, it's an acute catabolic disease right in contrary to marasmus which is chronic so this is acute catabolic disease and the time duration is weeks and clinical features normal fat and normal muscle edema and easily pluckable hair edema and easily pluckable hair and also in the picture you can see edema right and coming to laboratory findings serum albumin is less than 2.8 grams per deciliter make a note of it very very important and prognosis is considered to be very poor for Quashiorker so in the image you can see the infant showing generalized edema seen in form of puffiness of face arms as well as legs right so option b Quashiorker is the right answer now moving on to the third question maximum and minimum pressure in systemic iota Again, uh, numerical based, 20 and 30 mm Hg respectively, 5 and 0 mm Hg respectively, 25 and 8 mm Hg respectively, 120 and 80 um mm hg respectively so what is the maximum and minimum pressure in systemic iota in a cardiac cycle right 
So in fact, we have some numericals. So the maximum pressure is 120 mm Hg and minimum pressure is 80 mm Hg which is recorded in systemic iota, right? And coming to other areas in heart, left atrium, maximum pressure is 7 to 8 mm Hg, minimum pressure is 0 to 2 mm Hg. Right atrium, maximum pressure is 5 to 6 mm Hg, minimum pressure is 0 to 2 mm Hg. And left ventricle, maximum pressure is 120 mm Hg, minimum pressure is 5 mm Hg. Right ventricle, maximum pressure is 25 mm Hg, minimum pressure is 2 to 3 mm Hg. And systemic aorta, as we discussed, 120 mm Hg is the maximum pressure and 80 mm Hg is the minimum pressure. And pulmonary artery, 25 mm Hg is the maximum pressure and 7 to 8 mm Hg is the minimum pressure. So we have a table for this. Once you note down all these values, try to memorize them as well. So the maximum and minimum pressure in systemic aorta, option D, is more appropriate, right? Now coming to penultimate question. Inhibition of glycolysis by oxygen is known as pasteurization, deglycolysis, pasteur effect, none of the above. In fact, we don't have a term deglycolysis. Pasteur effect discovered by Louis Pasteur is nothing but inhibition of glycolysis by oxygen, right? So that's called as pasteur effect and this is because of inhibition of enzyme phosphofructokinase which is seen in glycolysis. In fact, I discussed about this pasteur effect in one of the videos in e-classes, glycolysis, you can refer that for more information so the inhibition of glycolysis by oxygen is known as pasteur effect it was discovered by louis pasteur more than a century ago while studying fermentation by yeast he observed that when anaerobic yeast cultures were exposed to air the utilization of glucose decreased by nearly sevenfold in aerobic condition, the levels of glycolytic inter intermediates from the fructose 1,6-bisphosphonate onward decreases while the earlier intermediates accumulate, which clearly indicates that there is inhibition of the enzyme phosphofructokinase. The inhibitory effect of citrate and ATP on phosphofructokinase explains the pasture effect. In fact, we have discussed various rate-limiting enzymes and various products which either stimulate or inhibit these rate-limiting enzymes, right? You can refer the previous video for more more information so option C is right answer now moving on to the final question infections caused by pseudomonas erythinosa include pneumonia osteomyelitis urinary tract infections endocarditis so what are the infections caused by pseudomonas erythinosa in fact various important infections which we are all familiar with are caused by pseudomonas erythinosa which includes pneumonia osteomyelitis, burn wound infections, sepsis, UTI, urinary tract infections, pyelonephritis, endocarditis, malignant external otitis, corneal infection. So these are uh, array of infections caused by pseudomonas aeruginosa. So first coming to pneumonia. So most cystic fibrosis patients have their lungs colonized by pseudomonas aeruginosa. These patients develop chronic pneumonia which progressively destroys their lungs. Osteomyelitis, diabetic patients have an increased risk of developing foot ulcers infected with pseudomonas aeruginosa. And burn wound infections. This organism sets up significant infections of burn wounds which eventually leads to fatal sepsis. And sepsis pseudomonas sepsis carries an extremely high mortality rate and coming to urinary tract infections this occurs in debilitated patients in nursing homes and in hospitals they often have urethral foley catheters which serve as a source of infection hospital acquired infection hii right and endocarditis staphylococcus aureus and pseudomonas aeruginosa are frequent causes of right heart valve endocarditis and iv drug abusers and malignant external otitis where there can be external ear canal infection right and corneal infections this can occur in contact lens wearers so these are wide range of infections caused by pseudomonas aeruginosa so option a b c and d so all these are caused by pseudomonas aeruginosa so there is no appropriate answer here right I hope it's clear. So to summarize all that we have discussed so far, initially we have seen the role of bisphosphonates, mechanism of action and their clinical implications, where all can be used. And also we have gone through an image based question of a baby suffering from Kwashiorkor and later we have gone through a question where uh, there are uh, numerical values pertaining to maximum minimum pressure in various parts of heart in a given cardiac cycle. And also we have gone through pasture effect and finally, various infections caused by pseudomonas aeruginosa, right? I hope it's clear.